a very good uh, sample of the type of projects that we are supporting, addressing the whole value chain and addressing different aspects of the hydrogen technologies, but also the fuel cell technologies. Over this presentation, over the day, we will um, review the different projects. At the end of uh, each presentation, you will have the opportunity to make questions. Don't forget to make questions as well in Slido. Uh, my colleague Nikos is uh, managing uh, Slido. Thank you, Nikos, for this. And uh, at the end, after all the presentations, uh, we will have a panel discussion. And uh, today we have the, yeah, the, um, the opportunity to have um, one scientific officer of the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, Beatriz uh, Acosta Iborra. Thank you, Beatriz, for coming. And I look forward for the discussions after the end of the presentations. With this, and without further ado, I would like to introduce the first speaker to the stage. And in that sense, I would like to welcome uh, Vincent uh, Matlar from uh, Toyota uh, Motor Europe, who will present on behalf of the Pride project. The Pride project is a very uh, interesting project, and the project, the title, and the focus is developing the protocol for a heavy duty hydrogen refilling introduction and key results. So, Vincent, the floor is yours. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. I have to use this one, I guess. Yeah, the big button. Okay, so I'm going to present uh, uh, the Pride project here. And this was actually a very nice project, a ver very special project, because it's, although it's a European project funded by the European Union, the Clean Hydrogen uh, Partnership, thank you very much, uh, there were a lot of international uh, companies involved because we are talking about standards, international standards. So there uh, were... Uh, Japan partly involved, but also the United States was very strongly involved with this project. So to give you a background, uh, we all ha know about the fueling stations for passenger car vehicles. There are already over 200 of them in Europe, and they are working quite fine, uh, thanks to the current protocol, which is the SAE J2601. We are able to, co to compete with the diesel and gasoline fueling because we can have a full tank, uh, 650, 700 kilometers range, and a few in uh, only three minutes uh, to five minutes. Uh, hardware is available all over the world, exactly the same type, exactly the same standard, with a nozzle of a maximum 60 grams per second. There was also, uh, within this protocol, a possibility to fuel heavy-duty vehicles, was possible, uh, but there is a quite big gap. Uh, the SAE J2601 for uh, the, we call it the, the D tables or the, the D category was coming from the Japanese standard, but it was also using the same nozzle as for passenger cars with a maximum of 60 grams per second. So it was quite limited and if you wanted to fuel uh, quite big quantities, it would take really a long time. It could take uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Time. And uh, so there was a need for not only a new protocol, also new hardware uh, to fuel a bit faster in order to compete with, uh, with diesel vehicles. So I just explained you the existing standard. So the, the new uh, uh, standard, uh, well, it's, we did not develop really a standard at the Pride uh, group. We, we developed the foundations to build a new uh, protocol. And uh, these foundation stones will be uh, forwarded to the ISO working group uh, 24, which is developing the ISO 19885-3, uh, which will be a fueling protocol for heavy duty vehicles. Although I must say it's not necessarily vehicles, it could be anything, uh, boats, ships, uh, no, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it uh, has tank sizes between 10 to 100 kilograms. So if you want to go above that, then of course another type of protocol will need to be developed. Uh, it is uh, also assumed uh, that there is um, a fast, a good, safe, reliable communication between the vehicle and the station. So we did not work on the communication uh, system. This will be work for the ISO 19885-2 standard. Uh, so that's a, an, another working group. Uh, we only assumed that this was available. Yeah. Uh, so it, this, all this information has already been forwarded. Uh, then the 
to tell you also, uh, during the development, we did not only look at the refueling time, we wanted to achieve easily 80 kilograms within 10 minutes of gaseous refueling. Uh, we, the, we also made sure that uh, a maximum SOC could be reached uh, properly. And also, and this is new, we also uh, looked at the uh, TCO or the, the re uh, power requirements uh, of the station itself uh, to reduce the efficiency so that we do not need to fuel at extreme low temperatures, for example. So when I talk about uh, the PRIDE protocol, I first need to explain you the different type of protocols. But actually, we can divide them into the three different types. Type number three, the most advanced one, is a protocol where, um, you, where the, the station will be extremely dynamic, uh, will take use dynamically of all the vehicle sensors. So pressure and temperature, tank temperature sensors, during the refueling itself. So it's very dynamic. Uh, there could even be possibilities that the, uh, that the vehicle commands the station uh, how to refuel it, it, its own vehicle. Right? While type two uh, protocols, those are protocols where first the communication will send all static data, all information about the tanks and the tank, uh, and the tank properties and so on. And then uh, the station takes over and he will do all the refueling using that data. Uh, while type one, which is for example the SEJ2601, there is actually no communication necessary. And the station itself will take all responsibility for fueling the vehicle. So now that we know these three different types, yeah. Um, within the PRIDE uh, wor uh, uh, working group, we developed actually four different protocol concepts. Uh, one is a type two static data uh, protocol, and there are three different type three uh, protocol concepts, which we call T-gas initial, T-gas initial plus, and T-gas throttle. I will <coughs> explain that a little bit more in the future. So we did not work on a non-communication uh, protocol yet. Uh, this is, was a decision made from the very beginning, and this will be taken over by the SAE J2601-5 standard. So this working group is working on the non, actually using the same principle as the PRIDE protocol, but for a non-communication method. So uh, before I explain you the, the PRIDE <coughs> protocol, I first need to explain you a bit the drawback of the SAE J2601 uh, protocol. In that case, the station had full responsibility, which means uh, the station actually does not know anything at all of what it is fueling. Uh, so everything which you see in purple and in black colored on this slide, um, there, uh, the, it assumed the worst case condition. So the worst type of, of uh, tank uh, <coughs> thermal uh, the properties, the, the tank size, the number of tanks, etc., the pipes, the delta P, the, etc. Uh, we, we took the most conservative way. And that's why on using the, the SAEJ2601 for heavy duty, it, uh, the fueling would be way too slow. Hmm. So what Pride is doing, it is eliminating the whole black part. So the only part where we do make assumptions is for the purple part, for the hose and the nozzle. So obviously we don't want to send all the thermophysical properties from the tanks to the station because this is very often uh, confidential uh, information from the tank manufacturer. So that is not going to happen. So uh, how did we solve this problem? Well, the uh, OEM, uh, or the tank integrator into a vehicle, he has to put all the thermophysical <coughs> properties, design, etc., into an, a model that will appear. Uh, it is, is based on H2 fills, and together with some assumptions of the dispenser components, and then it, uh, a T final table will be produced, or multiple T final tables. And the vehicle, when it arrives at the station, and connects to the dispenser, he will send uh, not only what type of protocol he is using, but also the T-final table. And will tell the station, look, please use this T-final table for uh, your, your fueling methodology. So what does it look like, such a T-final table? It's a simple table of uh, in minutes how long the fueling should take. 
And on the y-axis, you can see the ambient temperature. Uh, so of course, the warmer the ambient temperature, the longer it will take. And on the horizontal uh, axis, there will be the mat value, the mass average temperature, which is mainly based on the dispenser temperature. So ob obviously, the, the colder you fuel, the faster you can fuel. And uh, with the SAE standard, you always needed a minimum of minus 17.5. This is not necessary anymore. You could, the OEM could uh, make tables up to ambient temperature or even higher if he wishes so. Um, so using this uh, on the top right, you can see that uh, the, the, based on ambient temperature and dispenser temperature, you have a certain T final value. And based on that T final value, you can perfectly calculate a ramp rate because it knows the initial pressure, it knows the end pressure, uh, for example, 87.5 megapascal, so you can easily calculate what the ramp rate is. And then if during the, the process, the temperature varies uh, during the fueling, it gets colder or warmer uh, from the heat exchanger, the pressure ramp rate will adjust accordingly. So this is based actually on the, what we call the MC formula. It's called the advanced MC formula. And the <coughs> four types of uh, protocols that have been developed are a type two static, so where we only provide uh, the information uh, before the fueling starts. And then there are uh, three others. Uh, the T-gas initial is actually a, a protocol that always also takes care of the initial pressure of the uh, tanks. If it, no, if it goes to, to the station and the initial pressure is, for example, 20 megapascal, then you can fuel faster than if the initial pressure would be 3 megapascal, for example. Uh, so the vehicle itself will uh, look at the, um, its own initial pressure and then will send the, uh, the, according, the table accordingly. The third type is also a type three, so dynamic one, uh, which is called T-gas initial plus, and this goes a little bit further. It does not only depend on the initial pressure, but it also depends on the initial temperature. So the temperature of the tanks when the vehicle arrives at the station. Very often this could be much less than ambient temperature, depending on the driving behavior of the vehicle, and so you can fuel a bit faster. Obviously, if you have this third type of T-gas initial plus, you will have many, many more tables inside the vehicle. So it's a little bit more effort for the OEM to create all these tables. And the fourth type is a T-gas throttle, and T-gas throttle is a fully dynamic one. Here, the, the fueling um, methodology will depend on the gas temperature of the tank during the fueling. So if it notices that the, that the gas temperature rises faster than it does uh, in, inside the tank itself, then it will adjust accordingly. So obviously you will need a very safe and secure measurement of your gas temperature in that case. So it will be, need to be very precise. So the further you go down, the more important the, the sensors are for the vehicle itself to have a very safe and reliable uh, signal. Mm -hmm. Uh, while in, in the case of static, uh, you, it, it's okay if there is a small tolerance. Mm -hmm. So in case uh, if, there is a, if it's not sending any table, yeah, then it will uh, use probably the dash five from SAE uh, J2601, which is a very conservative method. And here are the results, and this is the, the, most, the nicest slide of all of them where you can see in the, the blue graph, which is the current D category of the SAE J2601, uh, where we are going to do some fueling. And uh, you can see that as soon as we go into the MC formula high flow general, which is the dash five version, the green one, it's uh, double the speed. And if, as soon as we go into the four pride protocols, which are the four last colors, gray, red, yellow, uh, blue, uh, the speed goes super fast compared to the current protocol. And we can compete with diesel fueling. This has been simulated uh, at NRAL and at ZBT in Germany in real life conditions and of course simulations via modeling. 
And so here you can see the, uh, the, the people who worked on it, uh, not only the active members, so on the top right are important, but we would also like to thank all the companies below uh, who have Done, made a large contribution, uh, including NREL and First Element Fuel from the United States. So I'm sorry, I'm over my time. It's Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I apologize. It's okay, Vincent. A yeah. very quick question from my side and uh, before, yeah. before you leave. No, because um, I think it's very interesting that you have uh, definitely progressed the state of the art and bring. Uh, bringing this uh, protocol. Uh, my, my question would be, what's next now? When, ah. when are we going to have this protocol in place so that everyone can profit? As part of the project, we also looked at uh, self-consumption self -consumption benefits of fuel cell micro CHP. We had the, the Technical University of Lucerne, uh, Switzerland, looking at the ec economic value of uh, micro CHP participating in in power and, and grid service markets, we had four, three archetypes, Germany, Belgium, and the Czech Republic. And as you will see, uh, micro CHP, fuel cell micro CHP uh, fares much better from a cost perspective uh, in these three countries, more so in Germany and Belgium and less so in Czech Republic, but still uh, the energy costs uh, versus with or without uh, are better. Of course, these are based on 2020 and 2021 figures. Uh, between 2021 and 2022, energy price volatility has, of course, made things more complicated, and we're actually considering going back and looking at uh, these three countries again, but using more up-to-date prices and, and see what happens. But our, our feeling is that uh, the, the economics are still sound, as long as you have a, a good spark spread in place uh, and a sound uh, policy framework in place to continue to support the technology some countries, for example, the Netherlands has banned the connection of uh, gas lines to new homes, it makes it much more difficult. Countries like Germany are considering uh, stopping support schemes for anything that uses anything resembling fossil fuels. It's ongoing, but I mean, it's moving, I would say, perhaps, well, in my opinion, in the wrong direction. But there are a lot of things happening at the national level, but also at the European level that are making the market more volatile and more complicated. But at the end of the day, uh, and this is my last slide, uh, a fuel cell micro CHP really does empower consumers. You take control of your energy needs. You become much more involved, at least in my case. Uh, because I had a fuel cell micro CHP unit, I paid, paid, spent more and paid more attention to my energy bill and the kind of energy bill I had, not a variable energy bill or a monthly, but energy bill, but a three, I actually chose a three-year contract, which sort of helped me through the, the energy crisis. So you really do become involved uh, as an energy prosumer. As I mentioned already, it supports the energy, European energy transition from a primary energy saving, from a local climate clean air, but also uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, by, by 30%. It provides greater flexibility to the energy system. It allows the further uptake of renewables, but also heat pumps, uh, electric cars. It reduces the need to, to reinforce uh, grids to support uh, you know, uh, further electrification and you know, demands of 200 to 300% more in terms of electricity in the winter times. And I think finally, it really does foster innovation and high value jobs. It's, this has gone through a lot of research and innovation, a lot of public money has been used to support the technology over the past I would say, 10, 15 years, if not longer. Uh, other technologies have received this kind of support like heat pumps uh, and uh, well, fuel cell micro CHP is, has received that support and hopefully with that momentum from, from the Enfield project, which was a precursor to PACE and then PACE, and of course, we'll see what happens at the end of April next year when the project ends. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing uh, more next year when you will have the final results, uh, but thank you uh, already for sharing the results that you already have. Thanks, uh, a lot appreciated. I don't know if we have questions. Yes, uh, a microphone, please. Uh, there is also an option to pose your questions through Slido.
uh, as uh, uh, during the whole day. <laughs> Okay, thank you for this uh, information about uh, this very big and strong project. Uh, I have a question in respect to Repower AU. Uh, what is uh, the readiness and the potential for uh, deployment of units which are working directly on hydrogen? Uh, as far as I know, there is nothing uh, available on the market yet and they're going through a research and innovation uh, phase as well. Uh, but the, the, in principle, it is possible. Uh, and, and it's not just uh, using uh, hydrogen directly from the grid, but also reversing the process, uh, taking electricity from the grid, creating hydrogen. These are all things that are being looked at to make uh, fuel cell microstructure more interesting in the market. Uh, not just hydrogen, but other decarbonized gases as well. Uh, are being examined as, as a way to, to fuel uh, fuel cells in the future. Yes, today uh, all fuel cell units are connected to the gas grid, and they all have reformers converting that uh, methane into into hydrogen and then fed through the fuel cell uh, chemically. But there there is the prospect of running them on 100% hydrogen. But it's there you have a chicken and egg situation, and I believe everyone has been discussing that anyways. Uh, since Monday this week about uh, hydrogen valleys, uh, <coughs> deployment of uh, green hydrogen, making it available, uh, who should have it first, Is it, should you prioritize industry, uh, individual homes, etc., etc. So. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, please. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I have uh, just a simple question. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not uh, catch this information from, from your presentation, how it actually works, your, 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 your program. Uh, what, is, what is the scheme of, uh, I, I don't know, is, is it uh, so, so some rents of uh, micro CHP to the, uh, to the end users? Oh. So the most the PACE project money, so the 100 million is used to help offset production cost. So to reduce the production cost uh, anywhere between, and it really depends on the technology and, and the manufacturer, and I, I'm, I'm giving a range because I don't know myself because it's pr pr proprietary, commercially sensitive, but you know, between 5,000 and 10,000 uh, euros support to decrease the cost. The, the whole uh, rationale behind the project is to, to use the project to uh, increase the number of units, to increase volume, to bring costs down like any, any technology. Thank you very much. One last question, uh, because we are running <coughs> late. All right, thank you. Very nice presentation, Jarek Milewski from Warsaw University of Technology. Just uh, could you give us some uh, details? What unit do you have? What house and what power range? And it was too big, too small. What you can predict for the market because it was 0 0.7 kilowatt to 3.5 kilowatt. What is your experience and, and what you use prediction? What size of this kind of the unit should be in the future? Well, uh, for the PACE project, we have units ranging from uh, 0.7 kilowatts to 1.5 kilowatts. Uh, if you're asking me personally as an individual, I, I have a solid oxide unit in my home, uh, 1.5 kilowatts, so it has a, almost a total, total efficiency of 90-95%. I chose a solid oxide because uh, they have a higher electrical efficiency and I have a higher electrical demand. The unit itself uh, produces 32,000, no, sorry, 35,000 35, kilowatt a year. Uh, I'm a high user of electricity. I have a plug-in hybrid, 25 kilowatt battery. I mainly use that for, for all my transport <coughs> needs. Uh, I'm also married to a Finnish woman. We have a sauna. We have high, <laughs> high electrical needs in that respect. Uh, and I, I can't say it's, it's not it's not good, uh, but that that's our so personal yeah. situation. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, uh, but I said, uh, like I said, especially from 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 uh, an SME or commercial perspective, uh, you can stack them. You can take a modular approach, and, and you see that a lot in Belgium mm -hmm. in particular, uh, because the spark spread is so interesting in Belgium, and and until recently, the the, the subsidies that are regional level were also quite interesting. So a lot of uh, energy intensive uh, small businesses have bought five, 10 
10 units and stack them together. So it really depends on, on your situation. But it's a versatile technology and, and there are different products and different technologies uh, to, to meet different needs. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation and also for uh, uh, sharing with us the end user experience directly. Uh, so now we will move to the next uh, presentation. It's uh, for uh, Project uh, Comsos. Uh, so we move now from uh, micro uh, to, to mini uh, fuel cells, uh, CHP. Comsos is a commercial scale uh, solid oxide fuel cell system. It's, we will talk again about an innovation action. It started uh, in 2000. 18 and it will be presented by the coordinator uh, Yari Kivyaho, uh, who is uh, joining us remotely. Uh, Yari, the floor is yours. Uh, probably you already know that we will control the presentation, so please let us know when you would like to move to, to the next slide, okay? Yes, that's very clear. Thank you very much. Okay. Presentation? Just give us one minute. So I cannot see my presentation. Is it already somewhere there? Uh, we neither, so <laughs> <laughs> it will just okay. take a few seconds, I hope. Yeah, I hope now you can see it. Nope, not yet. Not even now? No, I can only see you, Hans, and, and some other person behind the table here. Not bad. Okay, I think we should move to the next uh, presentation, right? The, the one uh, of uh, Grass Cooper that we have also the coordinator here. So we will skip uh, the mini uh, fuel cells and then uh, we and the innovation action, and then we will move to Grass uh, Hopper, uh, grid assisting modular hydrogen uh, PEM uh, power plant. We talk about area. We talk about area that uh, started in uh, in research innovation action that started in 2018, and it has. Uh, recently uh, closed, and uh, we have uh, Herman Nieto uh, from Netstack Netherlands here with us that will share us uh, what happened in, in this project and which are the next steps. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Uh, well, thank you for everyone for being here. Um, actually, I'm not your, I'm not the coordinator, but uh, but yeah, uh, sure, uh, no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> just, uh, a, just a fuel cell system engineer, just a, a very basic engineer guy, but. Um, anyway, so I'm here talking about the, the project. The project, um, if you could pass me the, thank you very much. Yeah. So um, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about what the project is, what we have achieved so far, and also what is going on in the future because there is a lot of things going on for the future for, uh, from, from this project. Um, so the, the project aims to develop a next generation of PEM fuel cell power plants. Uh, it, the goal is to provide grid stabilization services. This means um, helping regulate the grid when a power production, uh, when wind farms or solar farms have, uh, they, they have no production. So we are trying to decarbonize the whole grid system by providing uh, set uh, grid balancing services. So for that, the, the uh, a power plant needs to be flexible, needs to be dynamic, needs to be fast responsive, and more importantly, also needs to be cost effective. Uh, for all of that, we have taken the approach of working on all fronts. We have been developing a new generation stack, which includes a new generation of MEA, and then a new generation of uh, flow fields for the, for the PEM fuel cell stack, and then also going up to a new generation of fuel cell power plants. So we are attacking the problem from all sides. Um, the consortium is, uh, is formed with six partners. Uh, you can see them um, here in the, in the slide. And the start date, as I was mentioned before, was in 2019, and everything has changed a lot uh, from uh, 2018 regarding the energy, sadly, for a lot of us. 
Uh, the budget is 4.4 million, funded entirely by the by the European Commission. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. So, as I said before, we are tackling the problem from all sides. Uh, first of all, starting from the smaller component, but also quite important, is the MEA development. Uh, the MEA development has <coughs> been completed. Um, we have been uh, we have taken advantage, uh, this is for stationary application, uh, let me clear that, this is not automatic application, this is for stationary, but we have been using the developments of, of um, CCM technology for um, mobility applications to make the cost of MEA development uh, lower. Well, we have also reduced the platinum loading on the, on the MEA, <coughs> And, but <clears throat> at the same time, we have developed a membrane which is capable of uh, performing dynamically load. So you can see in the bottom right of the slide is the new European drive cycle. Uh, so um, and you can see in the bottom left corner a uh, graph. Uh, after testing this uh, new MEA in the laboratory for 10,000 hours, you can see the comparison between the stability of the new, which is the big uh, stable one and the previous project CCM. So big development here. Um, this goes into the stack and not only the MEA but also the flow field which is a uh, picture in the uh, left side uh, of the slide. You can see also a very homogeneous flow distribution in some simulations. Uh, but the, st the stack development is still in progress. There is some issues that, that we have to overcome. But you can see also, for example, um, the, um, this, uh, the graph in the middle, which is representing the IV core from the PM of the fuel cell uh, <coughs> operating at different pressures. So from this, from this test in the laboratory, uh, we are very confident that we are going to match, for example, the, that we are reaching the efficiency of 50%. That is the goal of the uh, overall 50% efficiency of the power plant at the end of, uh, at the, end of the project. Um, and then the stack goes into the power plant itself. So the power plant has been um, <coughs> developed to, to participate in the electrical market. More specifically, the manual frequency restoration preserve. That means the plant needs to start up in less than 15 minutes and be able to perform dynamically from zero to, six, uh, to 100 percent in 60 seconds. And a certain type of uh, the requirements that I'm not going to go much into detail here, but we can talk about this later if you want. Um, so the plan has been uh, developed in simulation, has been modeled, and it has it, this, the project, uh, probably I skipped it, but one very important key of the project is the construction of a 100 kilowatt pilot plant that we're going to talk more about it later to put everything together and see if it works, it doesn't work or why it doesn't work. Um, but the pilot plan itself is not just it's not the same pilot plan that the previous one. Uh, they are uh, we are trying to, um, apart from operating flexibly, dynamically, fastly, and um, delivering the power that the grid is demanding, we are also trying to preserve as much as possible the life of the PEM fuel cell stack, always maintaining ideal conditions for the operation and even doing some, uh, you can see the graph in the middle, which is the oxygen depletion procedure that is going, is performing really, really well in this plant. And finally, uh, this plant is, is, is designed for remote operation, no need to operate it inside. And we are talking about multi-megawatt scale plants. So um, you have a of remote location, off-grid location, or a very heavily congested electric grid area, you can have the plant there. Uh, and help with the regulation of the grid without having an operator on site. And now we're talking about the pilot plant that I was thinking. So, so we constructed a 100 kilowatt pilot plant that you can see here um, in the beautiful sunny day of Seville in Spain. Um, we, and the pilot plant is, um, is not only uh, it's not only a test station. It's a test station to yes, of course, to uh, make sure that uh, well, to va validation of the assumptions and the development that we have done. But it's also 
demonstrates viability in a real environment and it increases the visibility, and I will show you later a uh, few of the dissemination activities that we have done with this plant. But also one of the key ingredients is we're going for multi-megawatt systems. So this is a base unit for that development. Um, something that we can share so far because the project has ended, but there are still some actions to be done and we will discuss that later. But you can see, for example, the capabilities of the plant really, uh, pro really they have a really great potential to participate in the electrical market. Um, we have a really stable efficiency or old load points. Uh, we can respond very fast from zero to 100% uh, in 60 seconds, starting out from cold unless, uh, under 15 minutes. So this is looking very promising. The pilot plan has, uh, was uh, commissioned and testing in, in Seville for 12 months. Then it was uh, now, uh, last month, it was moved to Arnhem in the Netherlands, where it will remain there for another six months. And then um, we are going to Del Sal, to, which I believe is a hydrogen uh, valley location, when the plant will remain for five years uh, after the project ending operation, using uh, residual hydrogen from a chloroalkali industry. That way, um, that will be connected to the grid, and we will be dumping the electricity to the grid, so it's a real environment, and we'll be testing the real thing. Again, the pilot plan is not only, only, it's not only a test station, it's also the base unit for a megawatt, a megawatt scale unit that has already been designed, and we have, uh, and we have been even act actively looking for early adopters, and they have people um, come to us asking for, for quotations and so on. Um, and we are also exploring how this development done for, done for the grid balancing is applicable to other uh, applications such as mobile power units, power to power, and microgrids. Some of them are e even easier than <coughs> grid stabilization. Some of them may need uh, a little bit of help, like microgrids, maybe hybridization with some batteries or something. Because there are no batteries in the plant. That's something uh, probably a question will come up. There is no batteries in the plant. It's just fuel cells. Regarding dissemination, uh, we have had many visits to the plant in Seville. Uh, from high-level politicians to research institutes to universities, early adopters, DCOs, TCOs, and a good number of um, scientific publications and articles has already also been published. So, because we have a commitment to run the plan uh, for the upcoming years, validation still continues. On the le uh, left side, you can see the pen fuel cells. On the right side is the, um, the goals for the power plant itself. So we can say that at the end of the project, because the project has ended, uh, as I was mentioned before, we have successfully increased the TREL and MREL of the fuel cell systems to, from five to seven, but we are not stopping there. We are continuing not only selling megawatt scale units, to whoever wants it, uh, but also continue developing the, the research initiatives. And these two projects are part of that. Uh, on the left side, you see the Stack to the Future project, which is, um, which is uh, directly related to the grasshopper because, as, you, as I mentioned before, the stack uh, development is uh, still ongoing but we have uh, <coughs> stacks inside the plant running already. Those stacks are an intermediate stack with a lot of the development that has already been done running in the system. And that stack is Stack to the Future, which is already a product commercially available. And this is the continuation of that. Another big one is the, uh, is the fuel cell gigafactory that Nesta will have in the Netherlands pushing uh, production to giga, giga, gigabat scale. Um, and all of this is part of the IPC project. So there are, we can see some very concrete already uh, results or net actions, next, act next steps coming from, from this project. Here are some uh, beautiful pictures about the soon to be giga factory, hopefully. Um, for the moment, we cannot share too much. Um, it's important to say that, that yeah, this, um, 
this has been founded through the IPCE using the Netherlands uh, Enterprise Agency. Um, I think I'm saying everything. So if you are curious about, I haven't shared much details, but you can go to the website, you can see to the YouTube channel, we have developed <coughs> videos, so uh, we have a one hour webinar about the plant. You can go and watch it free in the YouTube, so. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's very nice to, to hear that our projects, they do have results and they yes. continue further than the project uh, duration. Yes. Um, any questions? Uh, yes, uh, we, we had many visits to the plant when it was in Seville. Um, at the moment, the plant is uh, in our name, which is in a is in a testing facility which is not easy to, to visit at the moment, but once it moves to Del Cell, which, is, which when, will be in May 2023, so in like five months or something like that, then visits will be sh available again. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, since we are a bit behind schedule, if you have any other questions, we can uh, discuss them uh, in the second session, in the second part of this uh, session. Uh, are we ready? Okay, so now we can go to uh, the remote, let's say, presenters, and uh, we will uh, start, uh, we will try again with the COMSOS, the commercial scale uh, solid oxide fuel cell systems. Um, Yari, you can hear us, right? Yes, I can hear okay. you, you can very well, and, see the and I can also see my presentation, yes. Perfect, okay. okay. The, the floor is yours, thank you very much. Uh, Yari is the coordinator of, of COMSOS, and uh, he will be presented uh, the, the, first re the project and the first results that, uh, that they have. Okay. The floor is yours, Yari. Okay, thank you, Eleni. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Yari Kiviho, as Eleni already mentioned and I'm the coordinator of these commercial scale SOC systems. And I feel sorry that I couldn't participate uh, program review days in person, but hopefully I can do it next year. Okay, and the next slide, please. And uh, this project is it's getting financing from a 2017 call, and the call topic was validation and demonstration of commercial scale fuel cell systems. And the project started in the beginning of 2018. And our original plan was that this, this project will, will continue only three years. So practically 36 months. And after many extensions for the project duration, uh, we are now having a, a five years and eight month project. And hopefully we can end this project in the end of August next year. So totally project is running five years and eight months then. And the state of implementation so far, just based on, on time, what we have used and what we are having left, implementation state is 88%. Total project budget in, in our Comsos project was around 10.3 million euros. And the FCH contribution is 7.5 million. And the other financial contribution is around 2.8 million euros coming from OEMs and the final final end users, uh, I mean that the end users of the systems. Next slide, please. Uh, we are having a very nice and small consortium. Uh, we are having a seven members and five of them are industrial members and, and, and two is, is uh, in the uh, research partners. We are also having a very nice uh, geographical contribution from north to south, from Finland to Italy. And from v Finland, we are having a VTT as a coordinator and a convion. From Netherlands, we are having energy matters. From Germany, Sunfire. And Fritzeland Solid Power SA, it, it used to be HD Ceramics. And from Italy, Polito and Solid Power, Solid Power SPA. And left-hand side, you can see the logos of the all, all partners. Next slide, please. And the key objective is this project is to demonstrate SFC's paid CSP solution 
and the cumulative number of systems should, uh, should be around 450 kilowatt. And uh, following the grant agreement, Convion has, has promised to install two units and 60 kilowatt of each, and the total power is, is, is around 120 kilowatt. Sunwire has promised to install six units, 25 kilowatt each, and the total cumulative power from uh, Sunfire is, is around 150 kilowatt. Solid power promised to install from 15 to 30 units of six, from 6 to 12 kilowatt each, and the total power 180 kilowatt. And, and, and the plan has a little bit changed in the solid power side. Now they promise to install 20 units and 9 kilowatt of each. Total power still remains the same. And this is exactly an example of what Hans already mentioned in his presentation. Solid power uh, 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 system based on six 1.5 uh, uh, units which are using in space project. And, and uh, our aim is to, to demonstrate all of those units, each of the units 9,000 hours, practically one year. And during this demonstration, we are going to prove electrical efficient, efficiency to be more than 50%, and of, overall efficiency have to be close to 90%. We also promise to prove that, uh, that, uh, uh, that we are having a lower emissions like CO2 and nitrogen oxide and particulate lower than in the conventional, in the case of conventional technologies. And we are also promise to provide statistical data for end users and investors. And these are quite easily measured and the, because they are, these all are pretty much the numerical values. But then we are also having some more general objectives to have an EU worldwide leadership in mini fuel cell CHP market, take a benefits from micro CHP volumes and cost reduction, project like PACE project, which is, is Hans already presented here, confirm investment opportunities, and additional job creation for mini fuel cell CHP market. And the next slide, please. And then we go to the project progress and, and results and actions. And, and the first one is to install a number of installed units. Project targets is to install 450 kilowatt and for now, we have not yet installed, really installed all, all units, but now we have installed or units are under installation process, or at least the demo site has been chosen for the 450 kilowatt uh, uh, units uh, power output. Sunfire ha has already installed uh, five units total cumulative amount of the power is 150 kilowatt, four in Taiwan and one in Austria, so they have reached the target. Convion has installed two units, in, one in China and one in Ost Estonia. Total cumulative power output is 220 kilowatt, and they have reached the installation target. Uh, solid power, uh, solid powers 20 units are on the way. Uh, they have an installation site for four units in Italy and 16 units in Germany. There are a lot of delays in the installation, but they have promised to, that, that all units will be installed before summer 2023. And the next slide, please. And then uh, other project target emissions. Pro, uh, very explicit project target is that uh, nitrogen oxide emissions are less than 40 milligrams per kilowatt hours. Uh, one system from each manufacturer has been validated by measuring emissions during, during normal operation, startup and shutdown. During normal operation, methane slip and CO emissions are nearly, nearly zero or well below detection limits. Nitrogen oxide levels are also very low or below detection limits. And so we can conclude that, that the emission target less than 40 milligrams per kilowatt hours has been achieved. And also system work as a <laughs> very expensive air cleaner. 
there are less particles in exhaust flow than in surrounding ambient air. And all the results from the oil manufacturer were very similar and proved very well that SFC technology is very environmental friendly technology. And the next slide, please. And third uh, target is that, that uh, all systems from all, all manufacturers have to reach electrical efficiency more than 50%. And preliminary results shows that Convion has reached the more than 60%, solid power more than 57%, and Sunfire more than 50% electrical efficiencies. So we can conclude that all units show very good performances, and in all, in all cases, electrical efficiencies more than 50%, and we have reached the project target. Next slide, please. Uh, risk challenges and lesson learned so far. Uh, more than 300 kilowatt SOC power has been installed. The rest, 150 kilowatt, mainly solid power units, will be installed before summer 23. But, but unfortunately, we have to mention here or conclude here that 9,000 operation hours of each unit in project will not be reached in, in, in the end of the project, August 23. That, that's something that, that uh, we are not very happy with that, that uh, progress. Also, we can conclude that the market segment is very demanding. It's always very challenging to find the end customer who is willing to pay some money and, and, uh, and demonstrate this unit in their premises. And whenever we find the end customer, uh, the final commitment from, of customer it's just taking always a lot of time. So that's is always causing delays in our project. Uh, however, Comsos units provide learnings about design, installation, and operations. All units show very good performances, as I already mentioned, and all systems fulfill emission requirements. And for now, it seems to me that, that the key objective of the project will mainly be achieved one exception will be uh, the uh, operation hours of the, each unit. Next slide, please. Exploitation and impacts. Uh, in, the, in the exploitation, the main exploitation of the project results will be realized in the product of OEMs. We can say that there is the increase in sales volume, increase in turnover, increase in number of the jobs, and also we are we are have a create new business model in our project. In impacts, I can say that we have a, we have a good set of the impacts in our project. We have an impact on the European manufacturing and comp component supply chain. We have an impact on European leadership in SOC product in the range of from 10 to 60 kilowatt. We have an impact on, on, on a shop creation. We have also impact on novel roads to the markets. We have also impact on environment. This sounds very good set of impacts so far. And the next slide, please. And if you wanna know more about uh, our activities in, in the frame of Comsos project, you can go to our Comsos web page, and here you can see the web page address. There are uh, some other results also. And the next slide, please. And in this, this slide, I want to thank you uh, very much, all of you paying attention to my presentation. And if there's any questions, I'm, I'm willing to answer your questions if I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yari, for giving us uh, an overview of this project. Uh, I will just take uh, one question that we have uh, uh, yeah, in, in the room, please. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, good afternoon, Jakub Kupetsky, IEN Poland. Thank you, Yari, for, for this presentation. I, I very much enjoyed the, 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 the figures reported for the performance. And can you please comment on the conditions under which uh, you were able to identify those efficiencies, 50, 57, 60%. 
uh, how did you standardize the, the procedures or the working conditions? Well, the working conditions is not perfectly standardized. It's, it's, it's conditions depend on the customer size, size uh, 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 parameters. And like I said, that those results are preliminary results. And, and in the end of the project, we can, we can conclude more detail what are the exact exact uh, uh, efficiencies. But, but yeah, those are the preliminary results. And all results based on the, on the natural gas used at the fuel. Uh, but is it is it close to the nominal power or is it like close to the yeah yeah nominal load? power yes absolutely nominal power thank you in in some cases of course uh, in part load the efficiencies are a little bit lower but uh, anyway in, in the, also in 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 part load conditions uh, efficiencies are very good in many cases more than fifty percent. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, much time left, so we will have to go. Thank you very much, uh, Yari, for the presentation. Uh, we will go to the next and uh, last speaker is uh, Nicola Loringa uh, from Everywhere Project. And now we will uh, see the project started. It's an innovation action and started in 2018. And uh, now we will uh, talk about the uh, um, portable plug and play genset. And uh, we will uh, we look forward to hearing uh, more as the demonstration activities has already start have already started. The floor is yours. Uh, we should share Thank the presentation. You. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you very much, Lenny. Could you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, and uh, we hope we you can see the presentation. I, I can see the presentation. Very That's great. The floor is yours. <laughs> So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gianni Doria from uh, RINA, Italy. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to attend this event, and I, I really apologize for not being uh, able to be physically there today. So, uh, I, I'm going to talk today about the Everywhere project and uh, the first results from uh, the demonstration uh, activities. And the uh, next slide, please. So the, the project whose uh, the complete title is uh, Making Hydrogen Affordable to Sustainable Operate Everywhere in European Cities started at the beginning of 2018 and it's going to finish, as you can see the slide, next year in October 2023. So we, the overall budget of the project is more or less 6 million and a half and uh, we received a contribution from the Clean Hydrogen Partnership, partnership of, of about uh, 5 million of euro. The project is coordinated by RINA. Uh, the consortium includes uh, also the system integrator, Gemport and Freem uh, from Italy, and THT uh, Control from Finland. Then there is the fuel cell providers, power cell from Sweden, and uh, the Italian company, Linde, Linde and MV uh, Park, Mitec from uh, French, Delta One from Germany, Acciona from Spain, which is one of the users of the project, ICLE and FHA. Next slide, please. So, the, let's say the idea and the, the dream behind the Everywhere was to try to transform the European cities in a sort of, uh, let's say, living labs for the demonstration of fuel cell and hydrogen technologies. Basically, the um, Everywhere aims to demonstrate the reliability of, of using fuel cell technologies in portable power gensets in order to replace the current state of the art solution, mostly based on diesel engines, in specific applications such as uh, I don't know, temporary events, uh, construction sites, uh, a music festival, exhibition, and, uh, and, and so on. Next slide, please. So the main objective of the project is the development and the demonstration of seven transportable gensets, and in particular, four uh, 25 kilowatt and three 100 kilowatt gensets integrated with the pressurized H2 storage, and by capitalizing the European fuel cell industry expertise towards the design of a reliable and easy to use 
fuel state based power generator. And specific tar targets, as mentioned before, are uh, the demonstration activities uh, around Europe, as well as a replication feasibility uh, study. And uh, uh, basically, the knowledge generated from the demonstrator across uh, the EU will be also consolidated uh, into a sort of uh, handbook and a web-based geo-referred decision tool for logistic and environmental analysis, which will be able to provide the potential stakeholders with new knowledge and suggestions for uh, viable use of the fuel cell based genset in uh, the EU cities. But, what is basically uh, the current status of the project? Next slide, please. So basically, we uh, manufactured, we commissioned, and we validated the first uh, two 25 kilowatt and 100 kilowatt adjusted and the storage uh, system. And uh, by taking into account the lesson learned from the first prototype, we also designed the second generation of gensets that are currently uh, under construction and uh, um, are expected to be finalized by the end of the year, beginning of 2023. But in the meanwhile, the first two prototypes were ready to bring the hydrogen everywhere in Europe. Uh, only one piece was still missing. Next slide, please. I'm referring to the declaration of uh, conformity um, um, to enable the use in the genset in public event, because probably in addition to, uh, let's say, all the technical challenges that we had to face, one of the main obstacles to use in public event this uh, genset has been the need of a declaration of conformity uh, C mark. And uh, we got it at the end. Uh, we, um, the declaration of conformity for the 100 kilowatt genset uh, was signed in January 2022, whereas the one related to the 20 kilowatt genset, as you can see in the slide, was just signed a couple of weeks ago at the beginning of October 2022. So basically, the declaration of conformity enabled our demonstration activities. And now we can take a look to our journey, let's say, around Europe. Next slide. So the first, uh, first of all, our uh, demo in the construction side in the period of March 2022, July to, to 2022. The demo was implemented in uh, an Axiona construction side in uh, San Sebastian in Spain. Uh, it's a large construction site with a, a ground extension, as you can see, of uh, 82,000 square meters. And it's related to the construction of a penitentiary, an over project cost of about 41 million of euro and uh, 17 building. The built surface is more than 35,000 square meter, really a, a, a large demo. And in the side, there were uh, eight tower cranes and crane number six, uh, number seven, sorry, was fed by our 100 kilowatt uh, everywhere um, fuel cell power system. And as you can see in the slide, the crane could load up to 7,600 kilograms and the maximum no nominal power was uh, 68 kilowatt. Uh, next slide, uh, please. Some uh, KPIs, just for having an idea about um, the, the demo, the demo extended over a period of 122 natural days with uh, on a total of uh, 86 working days in such period. And for 67 days, the Everywhere Genset has been fully available for operation and fully supported the construction uh, work. Uh, another important KPI uh, is the uh, 533 hour of effective opera operation of the Jenner and the 935 kilowatt hours supplied to the construction side with a consumption of 247 kilogram of hydrogen. Next slide, please. So the second demonstration uh, site, uh, a little bit shorter, but obviously more challenging because no margin to fail, is the 
Motorland circuit in Aragon for the MotoGP in September 2022, so just uh, one month ago, from the 15th of September to the 17th of September. The giant, giant screen installed in front of the main grandstand was powered by the 100 kilowatt everywhere genset. So the operation time, I didn't put the data, but uh, more or less the operation, the operation time was about uh, 30 hours. The energy provided um, was about 300 kilowatt hour, and we con the consumption of hydrogen more or less 31 uh, kilogram. So next slide, please. Uh, uh, this is the third event, a uh, temporary event, which is the first uh, official demo for our 25 kilowatt uh, genset, just after the declaration of conformity that we got, uh, as mentioned before, just a couple of weeks ago. The event was the AC uh, Hydrogen Energy Summit and Expo in Bologna, Italy, from the 12th to the 14th of uh, uh, October. And uh, during the three days, the genset power uh, powered the LED panel uh, hydrogen everywhere, as you can see in the picture, uh, plus uh, screens, uh, eaters, uh, laptops, uh, uh, and, and so on. A very short but nice uh, demonstration activity. This is the first one for our 25 kilowatt genset. Next slide, please. But uh, we're continuing with uh, our uh, adventure or, um, around Europe. Uh, basically, uh, the next step is Porto of Tenerife. The 100 kilowatt genset was uh, shipped to Porto of Tenerife. Just arrived yesterday. I couldn't include the last uh, picture uh, from uh, our journey in, uh, in, in the presentation. The location prepared for the genset is all. 20 meters from the bird, the port basin, and we envisage about three weeks of a demonstration in this site in order to prepare the genset in this specific condition, very close to the uh, to the sea. We basically implemented some specific filters for protecting the the fuel cell, and uh, we're waiting for the first results also from. Uh, uh, this demo in, uh, in, in the next weeks. So next slide, please. Uh, hey, this is just an overview about uh, our dissemination activities and uh, an overview about the awards that we won in the past, uh, the best um, outreach award in 2020 and the innovation prize in, two, in 2021. And uh, I have to say that uh, the recent results in real condition allowed us at least for the time being to meet the expectation in uh, our solution. Next slide, I think that's the last one. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? I think everything was clear. If something comes up, you can uh, contact uh, the project and uh, you can ask more. Uh, so we will uh, now uh, go to the second part of uh, this session, which is uh, a bit uh, more uh, interactive. Uh, we will have um, a, a discussion uh, with the four presenters and also with a member of the wider scientific uh, uh, community and of course uh, if we have time I hope we will I will also open the floor for your observations and uh, remarks um, so it's uh, now time for uh, our uh, next panelist let's say to uh, to be brought up to, to the discussion so I would like to welcome uh, professor uh, Maria Fulti uh, who is uh, today together with us uh, online and I would like to give the floor to her to introduce herself. It's a professor at the National Technical uh, University of, um, of Athens and I would like to ask for her first uh, comments on, uh, uh, the based on the presentation that she have uh, just uh, followed or uh, another general comments on our project overall. Uh, Thank you very much, Eleni, and uh, good afternoon to everybody from Athens. Uh, it has been a very interesting session. 
uh, highlighting the diversity of uh, the system uh, characteristics and the potentials for the different applications. Um, I am um, in the field for the last uh, 35 years, the general field of energy uh, consumption and uh, generation. And I have been involved on and off with the uh, uh, hydrogen uh, joint undertaking uh, for the last 15 years. So I'm very happy to see at first the technological progress that has been achieved uh, during this uh, time. And this is highlighted uh, by the uh, various uh, projects. For instance, in terms of uh, long-term operation of the units, whether they are PEMS or SFCs, uh, now we have uh, achieved uh, several thousands of operational hours, whereas a few uh, thousands of hours in the past were uh, problematic. Uh, the uh, uh, overall efficiency of the systems is uh, clearly validated, and especially for the OSFCs, SFC, we see that it can reach above uh, 90%, which is uh, quite reliable. Uh, problems that relate to the uh, degradation or the idling of the systems are being solved, and this is highlighted uh, by the project uh, presentation. So, um, as a first conclusion, I would say that I could uh, clearly see the progress achieved uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, system operation during at least the last uh, five years, and this is very positive. To start the discussion, I would like to focus on the special weight that I believe that uh, uh, CHP systems have in the general uh, picture of uh, the joint undertaking and the hydrogen uh, community. Um, the special weight, in my understanding, lies in the fact that uh, these systems can be operated with uh, uh, diverse fuels from hydrogen to e-fuels, to syn fuels, to natural gas, and they target a, a, a broad range of end applications. Uh, this combination has a special weight in introducing them and make them user and end application friendly. Uh, I believe that we have not yet reached this situation where um, the, the, the system is easily acceptable and adaptable to the end uh, use, but uh, we are on the correct uh, way. These specific characteristics of the systems, the fuel versatility plus the, the, the fact that I target different sectors from domestic to commercial to service sectors, to hospitals everywhere where you can have a combined need of heat and uh, power, creates special requirements in terms of uh, development that are not only uh, directly related to the uh, fuel cell uh, components, but more generally to the balance of plant and the infrastructure that needs to be uh, developed and validated for the long time uh, operation and uh, reliable operation of the system. These uh, are, include all the piping systems, for instance, the control systems, the integration to the uh, environment where the system has to be operated. And these are challenges that I believe uh, the projects that uh, we've just heard tackle but there are still problems that need to be uh, resolved and overcome. So the complexity of the infrastructure and the dedication of the infrastructure to the end use is one of the uh, topics that I believe need to, to be further uh, examined. Uh, going on a higher level, uh, I believe that we need to uh, have models for the optimal uh, thermal and energy, uh, thermal and electrical energy uh, operation of the systems. Uh, it has not been uh, very clearly indicated in the frame of the presentations whether the, the systems were electrically or thermally driven. Of course, I'm talking about the SRCs. 
Um, I feel a challenge. I feel that there is a challenge if the systems are thermally driven. In this case, they probably can not only cover peak demand, electrical demands, but they can only uh, they can also operate uh, to cover the, the basic uh, load if we see them in the framework of a district, of an energy community, or of uh, operation of a number of units uh, at isolated uh, uh, environments. What do I mean by this? That we need to develop models that take into account the uh, modulation capacity of the system, the thermally driven operation or the electrically driven operation in order to cover the need of a, a diverse mix of end users. This can be uh, domestic, can be services, can be uh, public buildings, can be uh, industrial needs in the frame of industrial uh, symbiosis. And this type of units, I believe, they can cover this, the, uh, the requirements and the needs of these complex operations uh, quite well. Last but not least, uh, one thing that I believe has not been yet matured is the need for business models that target the energy market requirements. At the moment, we are trying to trans transform individual consumers to prosumers. There is a need for uh, dedicated business models to be uh, developed in that um, encompass the entire value chain to make these prosumers part of the energy market. This is a very optimistic and long-term goal, because as we all know, uh, the, uh, the national and the European uh, legislatively and operational uh, framework is uh, still at its very beginning. A lot of countries do not yet uh, um, see the, the prosumer concept integrated in their uh, national uh, legislative uh, framework. So, but nevertheless, in the frame of projects, I believe that uh, we should uh, take into account the prosumer and the requirement for the development of business models that would allow the prosumer, whoever it is, an individual, a company, a complex uh, of uh, uh, intermediate escrows or whatever else, to be part of the energy market. So I hope that with this uh, short introduction, uh, I set the, the broad framework for the discussion. And uh, as a challenging discussion, I would like, uh, as a, a challenging question, as I would like to ask all the uh, presenters if they could summarize the, the uh, technical and uh, operational bottlenecks from their experience that really need to be very further in elaborated and uh, developed in order to overcome the operational uh, problems and the uh, broad acceptance of uh, the systems in the in the market. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution to the discussion. Herman, do you want to be the first one? Sure, why not? Um, so I think, yeah, it was mentioned that it's, it's, uh, there are very different applications and it's, uh, so I was asked the technical bottleneck. So in, the, in my particular project, which is the Grasshopper project, is a grid stabilization project. It's very different from uh, putting a, a CHP unit in a house. Um, what are the bottlenecks here? So it depends on how you want to solve the, the grid stabilization issue. Uh, do you want to solve them with uh, lithium batteries? Do you want to solve it individually, having every house a lithium battery? Do you want to have uh, solve them uh, in a medial scale, having a, a plant that can district in a district stabilize the grid and also provide heat, because we were talking about CHP as well. 
we personally my opinion is that we should i mean um, more bigger not centralized systems but not fully decentralized system have quite potential so what are the, the and that is the system that we are addressing with the grassroots project so what are the technical bottlenecks in that uh, technical uh, in that specific uh, issue is the hydrogen supply um, because we have a system that has demonstrated that it works and it can provide uh, electricity but also heat I didn't talk about heat because it was not the goal of the project but we are a 50% electricity efficiency we also have if a plant is a 2 megawatt electric efficiency we have 2 megawatts of heat power that can be uh, given to to uh, to houses immediately because the heat is produced at s around 70 degrees so it's completely ready for district heating but where is the hydrogen because um, at the moment the pilot plant is in, um, in an industrial park when a chlorocali industry is generating the hydrogen but uh, if you want to have grid balancing services in the megawatt scale either we introduce uh, hydrogen delivery systems with trucks compressed liquid or pipelines if we want to have decentralized uh, units stabilization the grid either we have a lot of storage which is expensive or we create a pipeline for hydrogen that's for me that's the main thank you very much bottom. Hans what do you think um, well in, in the case of PACE we're, we're focusing mainly on, on residential homes and, and small businesses SMEs the, the technologies as I've explained is, is already fairly mature in the sense that it's a commercial product that's already been offered by the OEMs themselves, Beesman, Bosch, uh, Solid Era, etc. Uh, I think there can be still be uh, improvements. I mean, the, the stack lifetimes have been improved dramatically and we're talking about 10 to 15 years. I think there still can be some innovations in terms of uh, reversibility, uh, using electrolyzers, making hydrogen on site, storing it and using it for later. Uh, following on from, from the last speaker, I think one of the main issues now is not so much a technical issue, but more of a political issue, and that is hydrogen. So if we want these fuel cells in the future to, to run on something other than natural gas, then, then we'll need a source of other decarbonized gases. Uh, already, I think, you know, a lot of policy ma makers are missing the point that these systems are exceptionally efficient already and you know we are saving or helping save the use of natural gas by using it as efficiently as possible producing that heat and electricity uh, what i like to share with policy makers a lot is that in europe the the total heat demand is around 400 million yes. tons of oil equivalent half of that is lost every year steam so we, we need to use things like CHP, fuel cell micro CHP, to utilize the resources that we have already today as natural gas and use it in the most efficient way possible. In the future, with the introduction of these decarbonized gases, we can continue to use them as efficiently as possible. Let's be honest, they're going to be still relatively expensive and very hard to come by, to come by, to come by, excuse me, especially if you want them to be green. So let's continue to use these uh, valuable resources in the most efficient way possible. And, and fuel cell micro CHP is a solution. It may be in the kilowatt side for homes and, and uh, scaling up to, to other applications commercially. Grid balancing is an e excellent example of using fuel cells. Uh, maybe on that point, uh, the fuel cells themselves, the fuel stacks, there could be more development in terms of what happens when, when you start modulating. Uh, the units are really designed to, to run them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. But when you start modulating, well, I think more work needs to be done in terms of that to, to ensure uh, good operation uh, of the units themselves. Thank you very much. Uh, Yari? So any technical challenges bottleneck from Comso's perspective? Yes, I, I would like to mention a couple of a couple of challenges, not necessarily real bottlenecks. Uh, from the solid oxide point of view, I think that we need some material 
and manufacturing research to increase lifetime and decrease the declaration of cells and stacks. That is very important. Like Hans already mentioned that the situation has coming much better uh, during the last year, but there's still space for, for uh, make everything better. And I also think that we need the system uh, improvement, that system should be more fuel flexible to use biogas, green ammonia, green methanol, and green hydrogen, for example. Uh, I also think that, that we should develop, de uh, develop and simplify and automate manufacturing processes to decrease the cost of, of, of solid oxide fuel cells, stacks, and the whole systems. And also we should put uh, some effort for the development of reversible systems with real sector, sector coupling, because that will be very important in the future, balancing, balancing the, the uh, uh, renewable energy production and used and, and then storage. And also we put some effort for the real mass manufacturing of the systems to make uh, uh, prices of the system uh, lower, to decrease the cost, and make this product easily available for the all, all customers, if you really can find the customer, and make those, those systems to be a real commercial product, not only demonstration unit. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Yari. And uh, Yari, from, uh, from your point of view, Yeah, you can, yeah, yeah, you can go ahead. Okay, no, uh, with respect to the technical bottlenecks, uh, I, I would say, uh, as in all the, all the projects, we have to face uh, several uh, technical obstacles, but I, I, I think at the end, most of them has been, uh, has been solved. We are verifying the uh, reliability of our system in a real condition, but we, uh, at the current stage, we don't consider the, the technical aspects the most relevant uh, challenges in our project. We have to struggle a, a lot, and I would like to recall uh, also the um, one of the last point, point of uh, Professor Fonti, not only with uh, respect to the aspect related to the business model, but also to the aspect related to the specific technical normative with respect to the operation of hydrogen fueled gensets, because currently uh, there is a lack of existing of a technical normative, and we had to struggle a, a little bit for uh, understanding how to operate with our system uh, during a public e e event. Uh, basically, one uh, of the main aspects, as I highlighted in my presentation, has been the request of a CIR mark and the declaration of conformity for uh, our system. This is, has been uh, really a, 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 a relevant challenge that we, we, we tried to, to, to face for, for both uh, our system uh, by performing uh, several, uh, several steps, uh, obviously, uh, starting from the reduction of the uh, operational and maintenance uh, manual for our system by checking the compliance of the different components integrated uh, uh, or, or in the overall genset to the different EU directives, the machine directives, the electric equipment directive, the PED, the ATEX, and, and so on. And then uh, to perform specific uh, mini hazard and uh, risk assessment uh, in order to integrate the uh, safety requirements for, uh, the, um, uh, for the everywhere genset, handling and uh, use the genset in order to avoid any harm, uh, harmful events both to the environment and to the worker. So the current, uh, let's say, uh, lack of uh, existing uh, specific normative for the operation of the that hydrogen fuel genset uh, has been really an obstacle. We try to take some contacts also with the fire department to understand, because uh, as you have seen, our genset are moving very quickly from one place to uh, another, and each time we have to get a sort of uh, approval uh, in principle from uh, 
the fire department. So we, we are trying to get a sort of a risk assessment and of the technology and its, its integration in the potential installation area. We, we try every, every time to, to carry out a sort of assessment of the regulatory framework at a local level. And we try to identify, let's say, the closest uh, closest technology in terms of uh, functional uh, um, and uh, potential uh, hazard behavior in order to perform a risk assessment uh, in comparison with uh, this closest technology. So this is, has been the approach and the main obstacle that we, we had to face for uh, our system. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know, Marie, if you have something to, to add at this point, if you share the, the views of the, of the speakers, if you have something to, to add on this, or you think there are also other things that they should, that, that they are challenging, that they should be addressing uh, with further research. I think the answers uh, really depicted the uh, situation in terms of uh, technical uh, challenges that uh, range from uh, improving the uh, degradation modularity, uh, the um, uh, stability of the systems, the durability of the systems. The, the key issue that has been mentioned by all uh, presenters is the availability of uh, fuel, whether this is hydrogen or any other type of renewable or decarbonized uh, fuel which I think is uh, a major issue that needs to be tackled in the frame of an integrated approach of the value chain. Uh, we need to look at the entire value chain from the fuel production to the uh, consumption of the energy uh, in relation to its environment, as well as the end of life of the systems. Um, and. Um, I, the only thing that I would add in this discussion uh, is the economic aspect, the fact that we need to look at balancing the capex-opex uh, uh, aspects um, for all the types of systems uh, in order to make them more attractive uh, for the uh, wider penetration, to develop synergies with uh, other uh, priorities of uh, the program, uh, for instance, uh, the uh, hydrogen valleys. Where do we see the, uh, the CHPs from the micro to the mini and macro uh, size in the frame of a, a hydrogen valley? Uh, plus, uh, and last but not least, the uh, collaboration with other uh, EU initiatives. Uh, since the, uh, this type of units, as I said in the beginning, that target uh, a very diverse range of uh, end uh, sectors. So I would, uh, I would uh, propose to look at the collaborative um, environment with other uh, priorities and uh, sectors of the program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just a, a last question, a short one from my side. It's also triggered by questions that uh, you have, we have uh, through Slido. Uh, it's about a bit how open uh, we are uh, in the sense that, for example, we have um, uh, PACE and COMSOS, they go beyond Europe and they touch also other markets. How easy, uh, how desirable uh, this is or, or how difficult this is? What are the differences that you have seen and are we open enough? Should we do more to share and exchange experiences with other countries? Um, well, I have a, a great brochure that we worked with uh, between Comsas and PACE to, to promote station fuel cells uh, for green buildings. Um, but to be perfectly honest, the project has really been focusing on, on selling and installing uh, the 2,800 plus units in Europe. Uh, but of course, we are looking to what the Japanese have been doing successfully between 2009 and now in terms of their Enerfarm project. As I mentioned, they, they are far ahead in terms of volumes, uh, installing 450,000 units over that period and actually bringing the price down, which is an important fact uh, and was mentioned, 
the economics, at least in Japan, they were able, and I don't know the currency exchange, but from 3 million yen to 1 million yen over uh, an 11, 12 year period, which is quite significant. And I think we, we, we still need to do more in terms of that in Europe, in terms of uh, helping uh, increase volume, decreasing costs, or of course synergies in terms of supply chain and certain components and things like that. And looking to the US, I don't think they're as far as advanced and they typically use fuel cells for different applications. Um, I think grid balancing, there are examples of that in the US, but also data centers, to be perfectly honest. I think most of the fuel cells installed in the US are in data centers providing um, sort of auxiliary uh, secure energy and, and cooling needs. We are starting also with this one. We have a yeah, there's a lot of st yeah. a lot of potential in Europe, a lot of data centers. So yeah. fuel cells have certainly uh, sure. potential to support there from small to large. Thank you, Yari. Also, a comment uh, from your side, since you have some installation also outside Europe. Well, I would like to say that that uh, from technolo technological technological point of view, e EU is in the front line. Uh, or at least equal good as USA, Japan, and South uh, Korea are. Uh, and I think this, this uh, technology's uh, level is not a problem in the case of mini CHP, uh, SOC based mini CHP, because the more problem is to find the customer. Like I already mentioned in my, my presentation, that, that uh, this kind of market is very challenging at least in the, uh, in the case of Comsos project. Uh, all companies, Sunfire and Convion and Solid Power has huge problem to find a paying customer for their product. And that was mainly caused our, uh, most of the delays in our, our project. So <laughs> I don't know, did I answer your question, but, but the technological level, technology level is it's not the problem, but, but finding paying customers are, are, are some kind of a challenge or bottleneck here. This is very challenging market. Mm -hmm. maybe, like yeah, maybe I can add a little bit because that is, that is especially what we're seeing, especially on the megawatt scale, because yeah, when, when you have megawatt scale, maybe you have a bigger company or bigger industry that they have to say, I'm green, and then they can put the money, but I mean, we, we have put a lot of effort in the Grasshopper project, and I want to address that, especially about flexibility, about modularity, and reducing cost. We have, we have gone from 3,000 euro per kilowatt to 1,500, so we have half that, um, that capex investment by a lot. But even that is resulting very difficult to sell to, to anybody. Uh, and we have the, the plan design and, and they have people that come to us and say like, oh, hey, uh, I have a stream of hype, for example, in, as a, there was a, cost, a possible application in Spain, in South Spain. Um, they had that stream of hydrogen that they were venting to atmosphere. And um, this could be a solution, but yeah, it's too, too expensive. So, so we are seeing that. And also added to the previous uh, bottlenecks, I forgot about talking, the, the grid connection, which is a nightmare. Uh, getting involved with the grid connections are very hard, and, um, and yes, so, so yeah. There is <laughs> so, room for improvement. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard because they, they don't, and especially I think this is uh, also coming with, when when you go into the penetration of, the, of renewables and uh, how renewables are um, making the grid less, less and less stable, and we, we're not following that with stabilization techniques. And that is also, the uh, funny thing is also stopping other technologies to go and connect to the grid. So that's another bottleneck. Yeah. Or maybe an opportunity for synergy. Oh, yes, correct. Uh, also, yeah, because um, with a technology like you were mentioned, like reversible and storage, uh, that could be a really good uh, solution, for example, with a wind farm or solar farm. You have your wind farm, and then you are producing hydrogen on site, and then you are doing your own uh, grid balancing with your plant. So, so yeah, for sure. Thank you.
Um, so the time of the session is uh, almost, <laughs> it's already over. I don't know, Maria, if from your point you would like to highlight something or... Uh, well, uh, just, just one uh, last sentence based on the uh, last uh, comments of uh, General. Uh, visibility, openness, publicity. This would help a lot to uh, improve the position of uh, the CHP uh, units in the market, plus, of course, the political uh, framework and motivation. And as an example, 20 years ago, nobody would buy a PV system because they didn't believe in the technology, because they were very expensive. Nowadays, we see it, we see them everywhere. So. Uh, Synergies, openness, publicity uh, are uh, key uh, issues that would uh, probably help to uh, overcome the current uh, problems in terms of uh, broad acceptance and trust. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you uh, ideas and discuss Thank the, you, uh, thank technical. you for participating, and also a big thank you also to the four uh, presenters. Uh, it was uh, very nice hearing about uh, about the projects and uh, and your views. So I would like to thank all uh, five uh, of you. There are some uh, questions in the slide, which unfortunately we don't have the time to uh, to reply now. But if you are interested in what you have heard, I'm sure that you can contact the project through their websites, and they will uh, come back to you. So a big uh, thank you. And uh, on the second floor, we have uh, drinks uh, to celebrate the end of, of this day and prepare maybe for, for the next one, for tomorrow. Thank you very much.